Welcome to this month's Ask Your Herb Doctor. My name's Andrew Murray. My name's Sarah Johannesson Murray. Uh, we're both uh, we're both trained in England and graduated there with a degree in herbal medicine. And clients consult with us regarding their health issues, and we recommend personalised advice in nutrition, supplements, herbs, diet, and lifestyle. And we can be reached toll free one eight 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 WBM Herb or on www.westernbotanicalmedicine after the show or Monday through Friday nine to five. So for tonight's show, uh, this November, clocks have gone back. It's getting darker and colder, and winter's on its way, and we'll hopefully start getting some rain here soon. Uh, for this month's show. I wanted to, uh, uh, Dr. Raymond Pete's going to join us uh, as usual here, we're fortunate to have him on the show, and I know maybe that people who've um, listened to the show fairly frequently have heard Dr. Pete speak on a very wide range of topics, well tonight's topic's no exception, believe it or not, he's, uh, uh, and he'll bring out, I won't even talk for him, he'll, he'll speak for himself as usual. Um, I want to bring out the topic of uh, Steiner schools and Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy and um, biodynamic gardening and medicines, etc., etc. It all ties into, it all ties into itself as a very uh, kind of complete uh, system uh, that Rudolf Steiner um, brought out in the early 1900s. And I know Dr. Pete has his own very uh, pertinent and personal background in education. But anyway, we can uh, we can get into that uh, if Dr. Pete's willing to talk about that. I haven't actually asked him, but we'll see. Um, okay, so uh, Dr. Pete, if, uh, are you with us? Yes. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and for those people who perhaps have only just tuned into this show for the first time and uh, haven't actually heard you before, would you just give a, an outground of your academic and professional background before I ask you the first question here that I don't think I have asked you, but you can always say no if you, if you want to. Oh, okay. Um, I um, studied uh, humanities as an undergraduate and uh, uh, eventually uh, went to graduate school in biology although linguistics and painting had been most of my previous study. And uh, since uh, graduating uh, with a PhD in biology, I've uh, done a lot of uh, counseling in nutrition and uh, general health issues. Okay, well, I think what I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to get at, and um, it's, it's not something that I've actually kind of written up beforehand or... Um, discuss with you, and you can always just say no. But I'm, no, I'll, let, I'll let you. I'll let you decide on that. Uh, in terms of your um, your work, uh, your life's work in uh, um, education and academics, um, would you want to mention anything about um, a college that you were part of at one time, or? Um, uh, yeah, it, okay. it was uh, so it, very very directly related to everything I did before and after. I, uh, I had uh, been a, a critic, critical consumer of education right from the first grade. Uh, I, I knew how to read when I went to school, and so I, I didn't take it very seriously when they uh, went through their, their routines. Uh, my uh, third, fourth, and fifth grade experience was uh, exceptional in a one-room country school where there were eight grades in one room. Uh, so that made it more interesting and it was completely unregimented. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that gave me the idea that uh, maybe kids would do better in a, a freer learning environment. Uh, and uh, my college experience, I, I found that there were only two or three professors that knew anything that I wanted to learn. And uh, my, my first teaching experience uh, con confirmed me in, in the belief that the institution tended to be an impediment to learning. Uh, the, the trustees uh, had their idea of what the students should do with their lives. Uh -huh. And uh, the students and teachers uh, interests really were antagonistic to the trustees, um, and uh, as a result of that, I got the idea of starting a, a school in Mexico where we could be out, somewhat beyond the reach of of the uh, trustees and 
uh, government types who wanted to tell us what we couldn't study and talk about. What, what year was this, if that might be? Um, 1961. 61. Uh, and um, uh, I, I had uh, been reading and studying uh, William Blake's work, and uh, so I, I named the school Blake College. And uh, the idea was that uh, we would incorporate it, but the students and teachers would be the only trustees. Okay. And uh, so there would be no curriculum. Uh, students could uh, uh, bring up uh, topics they wanted to study. Wow. Uh, instructors could offer uh, courses. Uh, students didn't have to attend. Uh, just a complete uh, independence. But... Uh, Everyone was interested in something, uh-huh. and uh, the, um, we had the idea that uh, since the students would use their bachelor's degree to uh, go on for a master's or Ph.D., that uh, the requirement uh, for getting a degree should be uh, passing the graduate record exam that students normally have to take to qualify for graduate school and that's uh, that's established in the u.s is it i'm not familiar but it's, um, yeah yeah okay it, it's a, a very standardized <clears throat> system uh, at that time they had uh, both advanced tests in specialized fields <clears throat> and uh, a general area tests and uh, we said that uh, if a student would uh, be able to pass uh, at the 87th percentile of American college graduates level on that test that they could have their degree because uh, practically any graduate school in the country would would be willing to have someone who scored in the upper 12% of wow. of American graduates. Yep. Okay. And uh, as it turned out, uh, students uh, generally chose to take that exam after being their only a few months, six, six or seven or eight months, and their average was over the 90th percentile. No one flunked wow. the, the test. I, I, um, it was, uh, you could see the process happening. Uh, people would come uh, thinking that uh, they needed to be uh, structured somehow, uh, but uh, the, the, what they learned was that they uh, were full of knowledge and what, uh, what their business uh, would be to uh, structure reality for themselves uh, to to uh, make sense of, out of what they already knew and use that orientation to then ask questions about what they really wanted to learn uh, and so they could use uh, any resources that we had uh, they could ask anyone uh, of the teachers uh, to help them uh, find the resources or figure out the problems. And uh, you could just see a, a very uh, quick change in their uh, sense of confidence uh, about knowledge. So I I'm, don't want to sound too ignorant, but, um, okay, so within a few months, you said that the... Uh, students could take this exam and they actually scored in the 90th percentile. It, it, how much of that in part was uh, due to them being the, the right kind of people that would typically choose to go to that establishment in that place and have that fairly free-minded, free-thinking uh, or maybe critical thinking or just alternative thinking uh, as opposed to what they learned while they were in that place for that amount of time that enabled them to then score highly. I'm not too sure I grasp what you're saying. In terms of a year's education or two years education and then being examined on that, it's not what you're saying, is it? You're, you're saying... Uh, uh, no, uh, some of them had uh, been flank outs at right. the state universities and such. Uh, a couple of them uh, had even scored poorly on standardized tests and thought they were idiots. And... Uh, when they had the opportunity not to be imposed upon and to uh, be able to talk to other students and, and teachers, they realized how much they knew and uh, could think about what they knew and who they were. Right. 
and you could see the, the change from someone who uh, felt helpless uh, coming around to uh, seeing themselves as a, a responsible citizen, uh, having uh, all the abilities that, that anyone has. Yeah. And then they went on to score 90% in the college entrance exams? Um, yeah, they varied from uh, around 90, 90th percentile up to about 98th percentile. And did they get accepted into? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, some of the, the state schools uh, said uh, they um, that simply uh, having, having that high uh, score wasn't enough, so um, some of them had to go to private graduate schools, but uh, all of the good schools let them in on the basis of their uh, scores. Without having had their previous bachelor's or master's? Yeah. That's right. incredible. Yeah, well, excellent, because I, I didn't, uh, I never did plan to ask you that question, but it just ties in, ties in very well to the, uh, uh, the thought that I had uh, drawing this up for tonight's show, that the Steiner School environment would be a good discussion for topic, and <clears throat> I know that um, you've been involved in education for a long time, and you obviously have a very, very uh, different approach to problem solving that's radical and it's very uh, cutting edge in terms of the way science uh, understands the concepts that you describe so eloquently in your own way that m current research is proving um, and that the uh, this topic of education, especially Steiner School education, for all the benefits that we'll bring out in the discussion this evening, um, how that ties in with herbal medicine, uh, ties in with biodynamic gardening, sustainability, conscious uh, behavior uh, as sentient human beings, regardless of gender, race, or political uh, background, whatever. None of those things ma you know, matter. Uh, but for the pure sake of intelligent, creative consciousness, um, the Steiner approach to education does seem to be... Um, Full of, uh, full of little gems that I think if most people were aware of and the uh, Steiner concept was more broadly distributed, disseminated and people had a chance to send their children to Steiner schools I think there'd be a huge conscious uh, rise in the, uh, the, the call for it. Uh, in, in terms of the educational uh, background of Steiner and, and the developments. We'll get into that in a bit too, but um, has some very different approaches to educating children in terms of their readiness for education, and I know that's also something that we can uh, discuss as the time goes on. Well, you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor. Uh, my name's Andrew Murray. Uh, from 7.30 until 8.30, um, callers are invited to ask uh, any questions related to this subject of uh, Steiner schools, education, biodynamics, uh, free thinking, lack of government control. Um, and um, the number, if you live in the area, is uh, 923-3911, but the uh, toll-free number for those people living outside of state or outside of here is 1-800-568-3723. So we'd love to hear from you, perhaps, if you've been to a Steiner school and or you switched from a public school to a Steiner school and how you, uh, how you saw the changes. But anyway, getting back to... Um, Back to you, Dr. Pete, and the uh, college uh, and your philosophy surrounding the college. Uh, it, you said there was no curriculum. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> the, um, we had um, people, the, the professors were um, doing it just for fun, basically. Uh, we only paid a couple of professors. Uh, there just wasn't enough money for uh -huh. uh, tuition uh, fees to the students. Uh, but... Um, uh, there were well-known people, painters, yeah. uh, philosophy professors, uh, psychology professors, writers, and uh, even a math professor. Cool. Uh, and um, uh, they, uh, usually they would end up uh, saying they were learning more from the <laughs> students than, than yeah. they had to teach the students. Right. And uh, if, when you look at the uh, ideology of of uh, public education over the last couple of hundred years, uh, you see that a whole theory of what an organism 
is is uh, related to uh, the theory of education uh, and what they're doing is um, based on a, an authoritarian uh, uh, social system that's based on a mechanical conception of what the the person is and uh, the, the uh, progress of, of biological knowledge hmm. in in the last 50 years has uh, uh, illuminated stunted. some of the problems with, hmm. with the theory of education that the brain is uh, the body's uh, energy organizing system and if you have education that conflicts with the body's own processes uh, you're going to uh, impair the body's energy system, uh, lead to uh, a reduction of uh, ability, uh, 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 create a, a tendency to um, uh, lack uh, adaptability in, in biological as well as mental processes. Are you speaking about, like, children being forced to sit for eight hours a day? Uh, yeah, Energetic but, uh, children? Uh, there have been, been studies, for example, in New York City, uh, kids were given an IQ test every year that they were in grade school. And they saw these slum kids coming in with an average IQ. Each year, their scores would get lower as they spent uh, the year sitting in school being oppressed. And uh, with, with our students at Blake, uh, just the opposite happened very quickly. They would come out of their oppression and uh, realize that, that they were creative minds, uh, not not just passive learners. And that same process uh, was discovered 50 years ago uh, in rat studies. Uh, the rat that was given an entertaining free environment became more intelligent, grew a bigger brain with a thicker cortex, and their offspring would have a, a bigger brain and, and be more intelligent. Hmm. So it could be inherited, passed on to the... Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and so the, uh, uh, the students who are being impaired by bad uh, public schools are actually probably passing it on to generations <laughs> of uh, oppressed I found it interesting in uh, reading about Steiner and his philosophies that, um, and he must have borrowed this uh, from uh, Galen or from, uh, yeah, probably probably from Galen. But the uh, the the four humor uh, classification, the H U M O R classification of uh, personalities that he used in his uh, temperamental assessment of children, that would um, enable them to be. Um, children of these characters would be segregated, if you like, uh, within a classroom environment or given completely different curricula to follow that best suited their temperament. And um, he mentioned the uh, melancholic, the sanguine, the phlegmatic and the choleric uh, temperament. And these, um, these classic temperaments here, they were actually uh, described by Galen in 400 B.C., and um, have formed part of the tenant for uh, alchemical uh, medicine uh, for healing via information on the humours. And without getting too out there and um, being unquote unscientific about it, there's a lot of scientific rationale to support it. So he, um, he used the uh, children uh, and their temperaments uh, to guide their education. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, uh, the um, our, we called it a student-centered education, mm. uh, following on uh, Carl Rogers' uh, client-centered therapy. Uh, he used a non-directive approach of empathy with with the client, and uh, in in our uh, the, the non-curriculum. Uh, the uh, sense of empathy was really the guiding principle. Uh, the um, teachers and, and students uh, tried to understand each other 
and uh, they together created questions that none of them had thought about before. Uh, so uh, the the empathy uh, tried tried to uh, listen to the uh, the character or personality of of the other person, which would uh, if you uh, had them categorized according to uh, humors and such, that would be uh, a way of organizing that process. But uh, with with our small group, it was a uh, uh, purely individual, adaptive, empathetic okay. approach. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know again, uh, looking at Steiner and uh, how he or how he was described. Um, by his peers as having formulated this uh, uh, system of education. The um, students themselves then were what I thought was particularly uh, mindful, and I have some of this background myself from from schooling in England, but uh, the students were taught to observe and depict the scientific concepts in their own words and drawings uh, rather than encountering these ideas first through textbooks, and, and that the students that came out of Steiner schools uh, were shown to be, uh, well, the Steiner schools were shown to have an above-average number uh, of students that became doctors, engineers, scholars of the humanities, and scientists because they were able to investigate the world about them in a far more uh, objective and scientific manner than school-taught students, perhaps, who would have been wrote taught by rote or, um, you know, to rep- repetition. Or, without, me- or memory. Or memory, yeah, without truly applying their own uh, basis for understanding a concept in their own terms. Um, uh, the um, typical professor has his uh, understanding of how a student's brain works, and they uh, think they have to impose their abstractions and such uh, the the science uh, uh, textbook idea that the professor has assimilated, they think that they have to impose that on the, the student's brain. But uh, the actuality of of a student's brain and personality is analogous to any organism. Uh, uh, a, a simple um, mammal, for example. Uh, understands physics very well. Uh, uh, birds, uh, crows in particular, are very intelligent and uh, can figure out physical processes and make predictions uh, that uh, uh, many graduate students in physics wouldn't understand. And they can predict that if you left meat <laughs> out on that rock <laughs> the day before, it. <laughs> that it's, it might be there the next day at the same time. <laughs> okay, so uh, then the other the other notable point then about um, Steiner education, and I'll ask you the question about some of the previous history of uh, how state education came into being, because I don't want, I'm not sitting here making an argument against state education and purely uh, illuminating the alternatives as always and um, looking at the holistic side of all sorts of things and education is one of them but um, from uh, from a Steiner perspective the uh, they were looking at the the main thing was the method of inquiry <coughs> and how this uh, strengthened the interest and the ability to observe and that was the main the main fundamental uh, guide that every student, being very different and individual, would have unique ideas and unique talents uh, that they could bring to bear on the science, because it was a very, I wouldn't say was, is, it's a very science-based, rational education. I don't know, uh, I think perhaps when I first heard the word Steiner, uh, I kind of thought, well, it was a pretty loose, kind of hippie education where you could just sit around and, I don't know, bake cakes and uh, play games and perhaps I don't know play music and it wasn't in, wasn't particularly intelligent. But it's actually the, the opposite. It's very true that <clears throat> given the uh, individual's creative ability in an environment where they're not stressed, they're not forced to perform, and they're not forced to uh, you know 
compete, which I think does lead to a lot of suppression of uh, expression in certainly in individuals that are not naturally competitive because we're not all naturally competitive, but um, everyone's so very different that these people, given the... Uh, um, the the sense to inquire and find the natural world wonderful, which I think is an excellent excellent example of how to teach people to to show that the natural world is an excellent tutor in its own right, and that's how I think it plays into biodynamic cultivation and that whole philosophy of um, giving back to the earth for want of a better phrase, but um, to not just take away, but to give back and to build up and support and sustain and, and all these kind of cool hip terms that we hear now as a just a part of being hip. It's just a very real part of um, being a conscious human being. So uh, in terms of getting them to cultivate this sense of meaningful wholeness uh, of nature, where the person wasn't separated from it or alienated it, alienated from it, um, that would enable them to get a better grasp of concepts that them individually as free-thinking people could bring to the table that perhaps would not be thought of or borne out in regular uh, teaching environments. So what do you think about the whole thing about uh, um, from the ages of um, three to seven, there is no there is no pressure whatsoever to learn ABCs and to learn... Uh, you know, facts and figures and rudimentary education, but that the child is to be immersed in that n- environment of nature where they're to look at nature with awe and to, you know, get into gardening and, you know, learn about animals and create that whole side of their, um, you know, their, 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 their being before they do anything structured with math and science. I think as well they don't read till they're 10. Right. On average, yeah. I think that's when they start to teach them to read. Um, in in my experience, I, I saw people uh, reading and, and talking about things they saw in the newspapers, and so I, I just spontaneously wanted to uh, see what they were doing and uh, had nothing to do with uh, 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 curriculum or, or being taught. I just wanted to find out what was so interesting. And... Uh, at the uh, Summerhill School, uh, started by A.S. Neal in England. Okay. In, in um, I think, around the uh, oh, late 1920s, it, it started, and uh, it was finally recognized in the 1960s uh, by, by uh, universities and such uh, as really having achieved something in education. Uh, his, he had no curriculum at all. Students could stay there for 12 years if they wanted <laughs> and uh, not study, but uh, the ones who, who did stay there and graduate uh, were superior in their achievement to uh, those who had gone through uh, taking classes every day for 12 years. Uh, they, they demonstrated that uh, the um, curriculum is completely unnecessary. Mm-hmm. If the student is uh, aware that there is something to learn, they can learn it just in a flash compared to what the schools expect of them. Yeah. I know, didn't you tell me, Dr. Pate, one time that you learned to read, like you were saying, watching people read the newspaper, and so you learned to read because you wanted to read the comics? In the uh, yeah, yeah the, the, um, the funnies were, were the first thing. Alley Oop and Smokey Stover and such were my favorites, but but then uh, my parents had a shoebox full of the little blue books, uh, classics that were printed in a very small size, and uh, uh, then the newspapers. Uh, I wanted to hear what was going on with the war, so I uh, learned uh, the the various types of things that were available. And what year was that? Or how old were you? Uh, four. Wow. <laughs> cool. Well, you're listening to Ask Your Web Doctor on KMD Garberville 91.1 FM. Um, from now until the end of the show, you're invited to call in with any questions, either related or unrelated to this month's subject of... Uh, Free thinking, uh, alternative education, Steiner schools, biodynamics, etc. Uh, number, if you live in the area, is 
Or if you live outside the area, there's an 800 number, which is 1-800-568-3723. Um, we have Dr. Raymond Pete with us, and uh, I'm very welcome to have him on the show again. Um, Dr. Pete, again, I was um, wondering... And I guess don't want to get it too don't want to get into it too far because it kind of sounds more like politics than anything else. But in terms of um, education, I know that in this country, uh, I think around the beginning of the seventies, homeschooling started uh, to become prominent or possible. And I think in the early days there was quite a movement against it. I think both probably federally uh, and on a state level. Um, but what do you? What do you think about the uh, concepts of homeschooling in terms of the um, overriding, and again, I don't want to get too political about this, and I'm not asking you to be political about it either, but in terms of state schools, um, the state being the uh, the government that the people put in power, really to do the people's bidding, not to be told what to do by, but the state schools that educate our children obviously have their own agendas uh, and i think you can see this a lot in some of the subjects that are borne out uh, taught in schools and uh, this comparative uh, analysis with um, homeschool children and how how the actual uh, how the rise of state education came into being to become the kind of totalitarian um yeah, the totalitarian source of education uh, in, in this in many other countries. Uh, I read that there was at one point in time the uh, concept of um, education by the government for the children of the people the government was uh, helping or whatever you want to call it, supporting, um, was because at one point in time there weren't both of the uh, both of the uh, parents of children didn't work. It's typically in the olden days the the woman would stay at home and be the homemaker, take care of the home, take care of the children. Uh, would then ultimately school them and or get together in groups. Uh, Why the the male person was the person who did the physical hard work, worked on the farm, etc., whatever, and, and did all those kind of things to uh, bring food in and um, you know just keep the house keep the household going. But that taxation came into play in the early early 40s um, f federal taxation which made it actually very financially uh, unsound um, to have just one person working and actually caused the uh, um, cause the need for two people to be working in order to make ends meet and that actually the children uh, were then left as the question well we'll educate the children for you so you just come to work and pay more taxes uh, but without getting too political about it I know there is um a true case in point for having um, that that freedom of choice, and that actually it's just not even thought about these days. Do you have any anything to say about that in terms of uh, being an educator or um, looking at it from a perspective of where it was and where it's where it's come to now in terms of not really having? Uh, well, I guess we do have a free choice. So if home schools do exist here in America, um, and that, I think the state can set the uh, curriculum to a great extent, even in homeschooling. Okay. And the um, uh, federal government approves the agencies that accredit high schools and colleges and universities. And so the, mm -hmm. um, uh, there are private accrediting agencies which really are, are responsible to no one. Uh, they are or kind of an abstract uh, authority that, uh, that the uh, citizens can't affect uh, directly. The government uh, approves them uh, because they meet the government uh, ideological standards, apparently. And uh, the um, state bureaucracies are set up so that no school can uh, grant degrees or credits uh, or transcripts if they uh, don't conform to those accrediting agencies. Hmm. Uh, so the uh, really the, the power to uh, grant a transcript or a degree is uh, pretty much a, a matter of mind control unless people realize that uh, there is reality and then there's the uh, official curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in uh, 
my my experience in grade school and high school uh, was uh, just not to pay too much attention to them. Uh, in in high school, uh, some of our teachers were openly fascists and and Hitler huh. worshippers, wow. uh, racists and such. Yeah, and uh, so it, it was uh, just a matter of, of uh, getting through it with without uh, having to uh, interact too much with them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I hear this. I hear this from you a lot when you're uh, either talking to me or on the radio show. In terms of the way that you think, the way that you conceptualize, the way that you uh, bring to life concepts that you won't find in mainstream uh, medical journals, in mainstream uh, government type research that you won't find typically in any abundance uh, unless you're just looking for the independent research that is available and you can find on the web and or the research um, that's being done by PhD students when they're writing uh, their papers for submission for peer review etc that do get published um, in terms of that free thinking that brings about that lack of uh, control, that lack of um, dominance in the direction of the thinking, I know that you've had a lot, um, a lot of uh, personal experiences with that. You mentioned that when you were um, studying that most of your professors didn't even really understand what it was you were trying to uh, get across to them that you had... Uh, read and when you'd studied the papers that were in the libraries that has since uh, were withdrawn that um, you had a very different uh, way of looking at it that they were completely dumbfounded by because it was not typical rote uh, just repeat repetitive kind of uh, yeah f- not facts but repetitive statements that uh, were poor yeah, science the, the system not only the uh, explicit uh, uh, accrediting process and agencies and curriculum, but uh, uh, the um, official uh, high high status uh, publications, the journals, uh, publishing houses, uh, all of all of the major institutions have ulterior motives, right. and uh, you have to look for uh, people who are motivated by. Uh, reality. Uh, remember uh, a few years ago, uh, someone in the White House uh, said, uh, "Your your problem is that you belong to the reality-based community." Uh, <laughs> problem? <laughs> while while we're uh, creating a new reality, uh. you're studying the old one, <laughs> and uh, uh, the concept of a reality-based community uh, was officially in the White House at that time of feudal outsider business that was being left left behind. But I, I think there is a really a possibility still in the reality-based community. Yeah, I hope so. We do, we do have a caller, Dr. Pete, so let's see where um, this caller is going. Caller, you're on the air? I'm here. Yeah, where are you from, caller? I'm from Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, what's your question? Uh, Dr. Pete, I was wondering if you had any suggestions for a person that wants to uh, self-educate in biology? Um, having access to a, a really good university library, I think, is, is important. Uh, the journals are, are too expensive, uh, even... Uh, buying articles over the internet, they cost thirty or forty dollars per article, and uh, so if you have, a, like the University of Colorado, probably has a good uh, science library where you can find journals and and current uh, uh, recent books, old books, old journals, and such. And uh, uh, if, if you uh, have questions and uh, uh, things that you think you should know, uh, just start looking them up in, in the library, uh, asking anyone that uh, has possible information on the subject. Sometimes uh, professors can 
can be helpful if they don't know what your real purpose in is. <laughs> and do you have any specific uh, textbook suggestions? Um, no. Uh, the, the, um, uh, there were uh, good textbooks published uh, periodically uh, many years ago, but in the last uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, even the, uh, the textbooks that, that were good have been revised under the, the name of the good author. Now, most textbooks are uh, created by committees that look uh, for the uh, professors who have the biggest uh, classes, uh, preferably uh, professors who have four or 500 students in each class, and uh, then they say something nice in the textbook about the work of that professor, and uh, that means that every time they flatter a professor, they sell an extra 500 books at $100 profit each. <laughs> so the textbooks become uh, really a, a matter of a profit for the publisher rather than information for the student. But Dr. Bain, didn't you recommend okay, well, thank a, you. A, a physiology textbook one time that was published maybe in the... 50s or 60s? Though. Yeah. Wasn't there a physiology? And you said if you could find the original one, it, it's pretty accurate. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure which one I was referring to, but uh, there are some some good ones from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, I have a, a little handbook of physiology from, I think, 1965 that uh, has the basic information and uh, doesn't have uh, the stuff on uh, membrane pumps and channels and so on, which is uh, misleading a lot of uh, present, present students. Uh, I, I was uh, going to ask you, what was the name of the... Um what was the name of the, it? Was Index Medicus that uh, you said at one time at the uh, university there in Oregon that the um, basement had all of this data that suddenly uh, got taken out of the library and you? Uh, no, that was biological abstracts. Biological abstracts, uh, uh, which had uh, references to international uh, journals, uh, all fields uh, related to biology, and when I would. Uh, compare Index Medicus, which was the paper precursor to PubMed, okay. uh, National Library of Medicine, um, I found that any interesting discovery of recent years that I found in, in the journals or in the biological abstracts, it took uh, usually about 10 or 20 years before it would show up in Index Medicus, and then it would be a put down yeah. as uh, uh, the these people are now saying that uh, coenzyme Q10 has biological value and uh, would scoff. So they would scoff for a few years, and then 30 years after it was uh, published in the science literature, the medical literature would finally accept it. <laughs> Okay, we're getting on to, uh, let's just uh, make sure everyone knows what's going on here first before I ask you the next uh, next round of things. Um, the number, if you live in the area, is 93-3911, or the 800 number is 1-800-KMUD-RAD, which is 1-800-568-3723. Dr. Raymond Peets with us on the show tonight, our special guest. Uh, we're talking about Steiner Schools, Alternative Education, Biodynamics, and you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM. So, Dr. P, I think just to get onto the uh, uh, topic of uh, medicinals and anthroposophy kind of joined together, um, you did mention uh, the Iskador, and I don't know if anyone's listening knows what the Iskador is, but it, it is an anthroposophical preparation, and that is very closely allied to the alchemical preparation of uh, Viscum album, the uh, mis European mistletoe. Um, do you want to say anything about European mistletoe and what it's been used for and how uh, how that's come about? Or um, uh, No, I've just been following the issue for more than 50 years. Uh, I, I knew people 
in the biodynamic uh, uh, Steiner approach, and uh, uh, they told me uh, various interesting things about the the influence of uh, fields created by uh, the moon cycles and so on. And uh, following up some of that stuff, I found that uh, there were uh, fairly main mainline researchers uh, continuing ideas that Steiner had proposed uh, doing uh, the interaction between uh, the moon cycles and uh, uh, botanical processes uh, from from the uh, 20s through the 40s uh, there were several people doing very good research unrelated apparently to, to Steiner but showing uh, that organisms are biologically uh, coordinated uh, through through the Earth and Moon fields. Mm-hmm. I mean that that's the basis for uh, lunar lunar planting, where I know the entire calendars are devoted to the phases of the Moon and the um, benefits uh, or the uh, adverse effects of doing certain plantings at certain times of the Moon. Uh, are shown, and that again, that's uh, kind of resonance with the way that the moon affects water through gravitational pull, and how that uh, biological effect uh, is exerted on all of us as living uh, water-filled beings, and so not just seeds, but mammals and uh, even bacteria, etc. They all all feel these uh, feel these influences, and so that's a, a pretty a pretty real scientific approach to it. Um, so, for people who want some other background uh, besides Steiner, uh, Harold Saxton Burr, a book, Fields of Life, he was a Yale professor, I think, who um, did some of the uh, measurements showing these uh, lunar cycles. Uh, uh, a professor uh, named Brown at Indiana University uh, did uh, a whole series of, of uh, biological uh, cycle studies, uh, day day and lunar cycles both. Uh, 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 Salko Tromp, or Tromp, T-R-O-M-P, was a, a Dutch uh, uh, biologist and uh, ecologist who uh, uh, wrote a, a book called uh, Psychical Physics, uh, how, how the nervous system interacts with these fields. I think that that also reminds me the uh, um, some of the points that were brought out about the pathology uh, amongst Steiner school students versus uh, students in the general population of mainstream education is that Steiner students had a sig- significantly or a statistically significant um, difference uh, a lower incidence of gastrointestinal distress as one of the uh, main symptoms of the stress, I think, that was brought out in the uh, regular school environment as opposed to the free-thinking, uh, liberal in the sense of being liberal, um, not the kind of modern sense of the word liberal, but the kind of liberating um, environment that students were in, uh, a little bit a little bit like the animal experience you, you first mentioned when we, we first started talking about the rats that were given the uh, kind of environmental enrichment uh, having uh, better and greater intelligence and their progeny um, bearing from that, you know, benefiting from that also. But in terms of the um, the lack of stress, I think probably, and the lack of, like I said in the beginning, the lack of competition and that kind of, you know, all, all, all that that competition nurtures, all the negative side of the competition, because competition is not necessarily a bad thing, but I think the way that most people compete with other people is usually in a fairly negative way. Um, what do you think about the mind-body connection? I, I, mean, I think we all agree that it's a, a real connection, uh, mm-hmm. both in our nervous system and, on, and in our uh, psyches. The uh, issue of helplessness, learned helplessness or inescapable stress, um, uh, that shows up first in the stomach as ulcers and in intestine as bleeding. Uh, but the, uh, it's really happening in the brain, uh, and uh, if it uh, continues, uh, you can see it now with uh, uh, 
MRI studies of the brain, you can see the chronic stress uh, thins the cortex of the brain, makes the brain smaller and, and emptier. Uh, and uh, the, um, the main parts of the brain that uh, relate the, the uh, digestive damage to um, the, the uh, nerve damage, uh, the uh, serotonin system mm -hmm. uh, contains uh, components of excitatory, uh, like the toxic excitatory amino acids, uh, glutamic excitation processes that uh, release nitric oxide. Nitric oxide reduces the um, energy uh, producing capacity of the brain, leads to uh, atrophy. Uh, the, the intestine releases uh, uh, both serotonin and uh, uh, nitric oxide. Uh, the, the system goes back and forth between the brain and, and the intestine, affecting every other uh, organ in the process. And you can see these same processes even in fruit flies. Go on. Uh, if, if a fruit fly uh, has a traumatic brain injury, for example, it develops ulcers and and the leaky intestine syndrome. <laughs> they can do that. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> fruit flies are just like us. Incredible. Or, or we're just like fruit flies. Yeah. But that uh, makes me think of lemon balm because it's so calming on the nervous system, but it's also very soothing on the, the intestinal tract. So that, when okay. you were saying there's such a link there, it really made me think of lemon balm and chamomile. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, keeping, keeping the... Um, brain steroids up and the uh, inhibitory GABA uh, transmitters up, uh, this preserves the brain and all of the organs, keeping Let the brain energy up, keeps the, the structure up. I don't mean to cut you off right there, but we do, the, the lights are going and someone's on, on the air. So let's take this caller from, uh, and where are you from, caller? Windsor, Ontario in Canada. In okay, great. Good to have you on the show. What's your question? Hi. Um, as far as intestinal problems go, I was wondering how Dr. Pete, Pete uh, felt about uh, chia seeds. Chia seeds. Dr. Yeah. Pete, yeah, go ahead. I know he doesn't like seeds, but no. they always <laughs> seem to have helped with uh, stomach problems. Uh, they're good for making funny, fuzzy animals. <laughs> but not for eating? He doesn't like them for eating? Uh, I, no, I don't really know any virtue they have as a food. They're very mucilaginous. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Exactly. So it's, it's they kind of like a with, uh, glycillium. with my with intestinal problems. They always seem to have helped before. What do you, What do you think about intestinal mucilages? Because I think that's the key component in chia seeds that the lady's talking about. A little bit like slippery elm or uh, psyllium husks. Or flax seeds have the. I know they have the oil too, but they're also very mucilaginous. Um, yeah, as long as they aren't allergenic in themselves. Uh, yeah. I, I've known a few people who. Uh, uh, had a, a bad reaction to even psyllium seeds. Oh, but the omega threes and stuff in them aren't, aren't that bad for you. Oh, uh, there isn't much. Uh, uh, I think it's it's the risk of an allergic reaction to some of the proteins in them that would be the only risk. I mean, you'd have to eat a lot of them to get a really large dose of yeah. omega oil. And the other thing that's helped before is uh, shirataki noodles. Have you ever heard of those before? They're made from um, um, a tuber in Japan that grows in water, I believe. Uh, what's the name of it? Shirataki noodles. No, I don't know it. Yeah, Is I, it a starchy I noodle? I think it's a cognac, cognac, co something root, cognac root. So it's a starchy tuber? Oh, 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 yeah. I think it's all insoluble fiber, like no soluble fiber, just all insoluble fiber. Um, yeah, yeah I, I read that... Uh, they were having a problem with people uh, choking on it, I think. It was the yeah, they don't problem. digest. They just kind of, but they really help with bowel movements, so. Yeah. Well, cascara does the same thing for bowel movements, and it's a lot safer. Yeah. Have you, okay, uh, thank yeah, you. Have, have your issues ever been with constipation then? Is that why you'd use um, chia? Mostly, I think just like um, intolerances, like pain and stuff like that, but I found any time I ate the chia seeds or the cognac, uh, those uh, shirataki noodles, you know, the bowel movements were always, like, perfect. 
Right. Well, if it's anything yeah. like Dr. Beat always recommends carrots. But he doesn't like seeds, so I was just wondering if the chia seeds were not really good to eat or... I'm, I've just not had any experience with them myself. No, no. But the, because uh, they do have that uh, that mucilage or whatever you want to call it around it. So yeah, I, I know psyllium that, seeds work for many people. So yeah, I think I've tried that before and I've had cramps though. So. Well, that's then you're then you're obviously having that allergic reaction then. Yeah. To the psyllium. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. Cramps. Thank you. All right. You're Thanks welcome. Thanks for your call. Thank you. Well, I know we do only have a few moments left, but I do want to ask you, Dr. Pete, and again, this is it ties into education, it ties into research, it ties into suppression of research, and this is the, uh, the, latest, um, the latest findings of a product uh, called uh, Lanosterol, and its use, its use in the treatment, in the very real treatment of cataracts without surgery, and it's extremely inexpensive, and it works. So what do you think about uh, Lanostro and uh, eye cataracts? I, I was just a little surprised to see a, a big publication in Nature, <laughs> and uh, uh, this group at the University of California, San Diego, uh, was actually reversing the majority of cataracts in uh, something like half a dozen or a dozen rabbits and then dogs, uh, both using eye drops and injecting it directly into the eyeball. But wow. they actually got established cataracts to clear up. Wow. And when I wrote a, a newsletter about cataracts a couple of years ago, uh, I, I noticed that uh, research in uh, treating and curing cataracts had been suppressed because of the immense amount of money there is in uh, removing the lens, doing cataract surgery yeah. is a multi-billion dollar business. Yeah. And uh, that uh, money interest had just wiped out uh, practically all uh, curative research in, in uh, eye uh, studies. Interesting. So we'll keep our we'll, we'll keep our eyes open uh, for Lanostro and any other future publications, and hopefully it doesn't get suppressed and buried. Uh, so that's something to keep an eye out for. But uh, thank mushrooms, mushrooms sure. happen to be a good source of that steroid. Okay. And you said it was a precursor um, precursor to cholesterol. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. preceding yeah. Uh, but between uh, uh, the. Um, polymer that cyclizes uh, forms lanosterol and, and that turns into cholesterol yeah again so folks. boil your mushrooms for 45 minutes to an hour and make a yummy winter soup and don't think of cholesterol as the bad thing because it's not okay well thank you so much for your time dr pete i'll just uh, tell people how to uh, find out more about you okay thanks thank you okay so